Let me ask you one question. How many words is an image worth? How many? Okay, you say 1,000. Wrong. This paper tells us that an image is worth 16 times 16 words. Okay, so today we're going to look at transformers for image recognition at scale. And this is a super interesting work. It's making sensation right now. And how they do is actually to use the existing transformer encoder, which is the dominant, most dominant model architecture in natural language processing. They just borrow that and to use that to uh, do the image recognition. They didn't modify the transformer at all. There are definitely a few of uh, previous attempts to use transformer in the uh, image uh, recognition tasks, but they basically did a lot of uh, uh, engineering to modify the transformer attention layers. But in this paper, they did not modify the attention layers in transformer at all. The only tricks they do, or I should say, the most important trick they do is to break down an image to a list of uh, pages. Like this way, there's an image here, image here, they flatten this 2D image to 1D, uh, 1D pages, a list of pages, which is equivalent to a list of words. In the NLP, we usually input a list of words as an input for transformer. Then in this paper, they also use the similar thing, a list of pages, and how they break them break the image down, that's the thing that we're going to go through. And more importantly, they achieve a lot of state of the art with transformer architecture. By the way, I make deep learning explained video every week. So if you would like to receive more relevant videos like this, uh, don't forget to subscribe. And the your subscription is also my best encouragement to make more videos like this. So what's special about this paper? For me, it's super special. Uh, I mean, quite special. So uh, they use a standard transformer encoder uh, to perform image processing tasks. The important thing is they don't, they didn't put any inductive files to the model structure. If you think about CNN convolutional neural networks, it actually has a lot of uh, assumption about image, uh, like locali uh, locality, that kind of things. But a transformer doesn't have any assumption about image. In fact, it was originally designed for text process, natural language processing. And using transformer to process image, it's a more challenging thing to do. And as you know, the transformer takes, uh, uh, takes the, a sequence of tokens as input, like sentence, right? One sentence have uh, uh, a lot of words, list of words, and the transformer actually takes that as, uh, as a, an input. Then how you fit an image to transformer, it's really, really a problem. And this paper, they use an interesting way to decompose an image to a sequence of pages, uh, which I'll cover later what, what's pages. And they achieve the uh, kind of state of the art results in multiple benchmarks, which is uh, pretty, pretty awesome. And it's cheaper to pre-train compared to other uh, model. They also do the pre-training like ResNet. It's just the two times cheaper than that. So that's why this paper is significant and uh, makes such a sensation. Okay, so this paper is currently under review as a conference paper, a ICLR. So let's look at that self-attention, how to apply self-attention to image. Self-attention is a very important mechanism they employed in the transformer architecture. In fact, it's the kind of the soul of transformer. And normally the transformer, the standard transformer, when it process one token, they say it 
natural language processing. When you process one word, then you will pay, you will decide uh, how to pay the attention to other words, i.e., other tokens. And to use this concept to image the model transformer process one one pixel, each pixel, then you attend to every other pixels. But the problem is you have so many pixels in one image. And this will just make the computational cost really high. And remember the attention attention layer to the number of pixels or number of tokens is uh, the time complexity to number of pixels or tokens is quadratic time complexity to the n square. So that's very expensive. If you have uh, maybe 1,000 pixels versus 1 million pixels, then your cost will be tremendous difference. They say 100 versus 1,000, then your cost will be 100 times difference in the attention self-attention layer. So uh, previous work, it's not like never have people use transformer to process image. They are, but they mostly apply a spatialized attention mechanism. They only pay attention to local uh, pixels. They don't pay attention to all pixels because this will be way too expensive. And they kind of make this re usually require very complex feature engineering. And also you need to find a way to optimize for your hardware. Uh, because uh, it's just a spatial architecture doesn't like the transformer is well suited to GPUs, these kind of parallel processors. Okay, so let's look at how the vision transformer works. Yeah, by the way, they, they call this transformer they used to process images, vision transformer. So how how you work? First, firstly, they spill it, spill it. Spill it and image into patches. Uh, patches, then when you have those patches, those patches uh, are treated as the same way as words or tokens in natural language processing. And you will have the patch embedding layers, which is FIFO layers, then before you fit into the transformer blocks. Then uh, the sequence of uh, pages will have their own vectors. So you have a list of vectors. Every page will be uh, a vector. Then you will have a list of vectors as transformer input. So let's look at the, a picture because a picture was uh, 16 times 16 words. Vision transformer. You have the, let's say you have an image and in this paper, they break they, they break down an image to uh, s many smaller pages, and in the standard setup, each page is cons consists of uh, sixteen times sixteen pixels. So to understand this, uh, let's say we have one image, then it's broken down to nine pages. These nine pictures will be flattened to a sequence. The most important thing is you need to convert two D to one D, and how you do it, just flatten, flatten this two D array to one D array, and so that you can fit into your transform architecture. But before that, you need to have the linear projection of uh, flattened pictures, which is a page embedding in the NLP content. It's called War embedding or war piece embedding, and uh, you will also add a position embedding. Position embedding can be done easily, like you use a sine waves to represent different uh, position. And if you are not familiar with transformer architecture, maybe you are from the computer vision background, you're not that familiar with transformer. I'll put my videos there where I explain transformer in the description below, so you can check what the uh, positional embedding is. Okay, and uh, 
then feed this into the transformer encoder. The transformer encoder uh, consists of uh, one a lot of transformer blocks, and one block consists of one self attention attention layers and the two multi layer perception or two you can say is uh, before neural network. And after that, you have uh, multi layer percep perception on top of all this to do the prediction. And the dimension is number of your class classes. And the whole most important part in this paper, I think it's how they break down an image to smaller patches, uh, which is uh, explained in this slide. Basically reshape reshape the image. Uh, image usually we represent an image in a 3D matrix form. This is like the resolution. Resolution contains a height and the width, uh, the height and the width, and the, the colors, RGB colors, which is uh, three dimensional. So uh, you have the 3D matrix here. But the Burr model just cannot take 3D matrix as input. So you need to flatten to 2D uh, patches. But by the way, this is 2D image. 2D image, you need to use a 3D matrix to represent that because you have a color code. And now you flatten this to a 2D matrix. Basically, it's a 1D sequence. sequence. So um, you have like this. N is your sequence length, and this is the rest of. The rest of them is, uh, this is called page size, page size here. Uh, page size the, just uh, means how big your page is. In uh, the standard setup, the, the page size equals to 16 pixels, means you will have like 16 times 16 uh, patch block, then you break down your image to a lot of uh, small batch blocks. Then we call one one patch. Then we have a sequence of patch like this. You fit this into the model. Then uh, this is just the dimension, dimension size of the patch. You can calculate that because you break down this 3D to 2D, then you will just naturally become this. This is the patch size square, which means how many pixels here and the times your uh, color color dimension. So this is your dimension. And this is the number of your patches. And the sequence length can be calculated like this way, high uh, times width and divided by pixel size square. If you um, don't understand this, um, probably pause the video and think about this. You, you will be able to understand. And the each patch each patch has a d dimension it's a d dimensional vector in the nlp content uh, we call this uh, embedding size uh, word embedding size and in this is we call patch size oh sorry it's not a good word it's patch dimension we and in nlp we can call the word embedding dimension so you, basically this is how you break down the page how you break down an image um yeah, that's just roughly how you break it down. And just think about it. Bef before you watch this video, before you really read this paper, can you uh, come up with the idea like this to break down an image? I think it's the most lesson that we, we probably want to learn. How to use the existing technology to solve the problems they and not be solved by this technology. Like transformers, it's just always there. But not many people really apply transformer to computer vision. And this is why they can be successful. One of the reasons they, they kind of break it down like this way. And definitely, it's not a designing factor. This is one very important uh, Component. Another component is you need to have a huge amount of computational power, which I'll cover later. This is really intense work. Okay, um, to use transformer, one tricky thing is uh, uh, how you end up representing the whole image because 
in the transformer, you input this sequence of uh, page, pages, then you will also have output of the vectors to represent uh, each page. But in an image, you, may, you maybe have 100 pages, and which means you have 100 vectors. And how you select those, how you use those 100 vectors to represent the image. You want to concatenate that? Concatenate all them? That's not gonna work because if you have two, uh, like two different resolution images, they will have two different number of vectors. If concatenate, you have two different sizes of vectors. Then, therefore, you cannot perform classification. Your classifier will now have the fixed dimensional input. So, how you do that? In the Burr paper, if you're familiar with NLP, there's a Burr which is also use the transformer encoder to pre-train large language models. And they, when they do the pre-training, they always put the cl classification token. In this work, they call the class token. This is basically when you feed a page, pages as input, you always uh, prepend one classification token as your first patch like this. This is supposed to your page number one, page number two, page number three. But you also put a page number zero, which is a classification token. Then after the transformer, you have the vector for this one, vector for this one, vector for this one, and you always use classification tokens representation to represent the whole image. If you are not fam familiar with this, um, I have, uh, I'm going to publish uh, a Burr the Burr video, Burr explain video, I will also put it in the description down below. Probably will be published a week later. Then you use this vector to do your perform your classification task. Okay, so uh, another important component is positional embedding. Because uh, if you don't put in position information to your pages, you probably not know, uh, like this page, where this small image block actually located in the whole image. You will not know, you will not know. You, you, it, because it's, it can be like in the middle, it can be uh, um, maybe on the bottom right, but in fact it's on the top top left. So if you don't know their relative uh, relation, then you will not able to assemble the whole picture of the original image, right? So that's why position positional embedding is important. In the Burr, in the transformer model, they use the fixed uh, positional embeddings. They basically use the side waves to, different side waves, different wavelengths of side waves to represent different position. And they also try three different ways to present uh, positional embedding. So the first one is to use the 1D dimensional. It's basically exactly the same as what we normally use in NLP, which is to give the spatial eye to treat uh, this uh, as a sequence, a 1D sequence, sequence of pages, and give the spatial ID to every different position. For example, position number one will give you a spatial ID, position number two will give you a spatial ID. So when the model process this token, it sees it, the, this spatial ID, then you will know you will know that it's actually position number one, it's actually position number two. And uh, another way is to use a 2D, because it's 2D image, basically. So they use a 2D dimensional positional embedding. So how they implement this, they have two uh, embeddings. Uh, one is called x-axis embeddings, another is called y-axis embeddings. So uh, each of them have the half of dimension uh, compared to this one dimensional embedding, the full embedding size. Then after that, they concatenate these 2D, two different embeddings to, into one. So they will have the same size vectors as the 1D dim, uh, dimensional imb positional embeddings. Because th their assumption, their, in their intuition is that because it's 2D image, if you, so that if you put the 2D information to 
to the model, model will understand uh, the image better because you have more position information. And last one is they use the relative, basically is to tell the model how far these pages are from each other. Uh, they put it, these kind of information to the model, then the model can kind of uh, learn and This is three different ways, but the, in the end, they they did actually did an experiment, and they found out the first the, the actually the first one the most naive way is actually perform performing best. In case you are not really familiar with transformer, the transformer let's put a spatial ID to every position. How they actually implement the that spatial ID? They actually use a sine sine wave, uh, different wavelength of sine wave, and this is when you have a different position and different dimensions, you will have a different side wave. And this is the roughly show you how they do that. And I'm not going to cover that in this video because it will be way too long. So still uh, the same, I put a video in the description down below, the Transformer Explain video. If you're interested, uh, feel free to check it out. So let's see how they some more detail about how they do positional embedding. They add the positional embedding basically is the the fixed one use a side wave. I believe they use side wave. They did mention in the paper, but I believe they use side wave to represent a spatial ID for each uh, position. And this is now learned embedding. It's just a pre-design. Already use the heuristic to tell the model what positions should be what and model will figure out it really fast when you see it's basically this ID is, means position one, right? This ID means position two. Another one is they, they don't put any heuristic to the model. They let the model to learn that. And actually transformer model, trans, transformer paper, the original paper also try this learn positional embedding, but it does not uh, yell the good result. And the, the, uh, another method is they use a slightly different way. They use a layer share embedding. Basically, it's every layer they have uh, one share embeddings. And this one is like position embedding in the, at the beginning of each layer. So you have a lot of different layers for, if you have 12 layers, you'll probably have 12 positional embedding layers. And this one is one positional embedding layer they share across all the layers, slightly different. If you're interested, uh, check out the paper's uh, appendix. They have uh, more detail about that, but I can tell you in the end, they selected this, which is conceptually simple and uh, just works better. This is the, ex the experiment they, they do, and they use the vision Transformer the base base model with uh, page size equals to sixteen. This is page size. Then evaluate on the ImageNet five char linear. Uh, and as you can see, the first the first one is basically the baseline is to train a model without any positional embeddings, which is insane, I would say. But it kind of uh, ha still have has a quite good result, I would say 61. I'm not really sure how this compared to the rest because the, the 0 0.03 difference, is that big or small? Because I'm not that computer vision person, I cannot tell you. And uh, for 1D dimensional embedding, which is the the old default in this paper, it actually has a very good result. And you, if you use the learn embedding layer to share across the layer, then, uh, so this is the positional embedding type, and this is for the for this column, for this uh, axis. For this axis, it means how you uh, structure the embeddings. You want the embedding to be the predefined one, or you want it to be learned, and how you want it be to learn. Uh, you want it uh, be learned. Every layer, in every layer, you have uh, a lot of different positional embedding layers, or you want just one layer and they share across the layers. And they found out if you use 1D positional embedding, you actually always have the 
the better results. I mean, all, almost always. And if you use the predefined one, you have the best result. They just uh, the conclusion. And for the two D dimensional embeddings, position embeddings, it's just not perform mean better than the one D dimensional embeddings. Which is a little bit strange because you probably will think it's a 2D image. If you put a 2D information, it should be better, but it's just not a case. So that's why they end up uh, using 1D dimensional embedding with the default. Uh, okay, so that's all. If you really want to know if they use a sine wave to represent the uh, positions, check out their paper. I think they will be released. Check out their code. I think they will be releasing code after review. That would be interesting. Okay, as for the model architecture, model architecture is uh, very simple. It's just like the transformer. So transformer has the first the layer. Maybe let's look at the, this picture first. You have the patch embeddings, uh, embedded patches, which is you have the vector for your d-dimensional vector for your patch. Then you put this into your transformer block. You do the layer normalization first, then uh, go to the uh, self intention layers. And after that, you will do the layer normalization again, and two multi layer perceptrons. Then, one thing you need to uh, be aware of there will be there's a residual connection in the self attention layer and the, the multi layer perceptron layers. Okay, so this is the math. If you write it down into the math, you will see this one. Basically, uh, first you in first layer you have positional embeddings, and the your tokens, your your patch patch vectors for your vectors for each patches, and plus with your your positional embeddings, then you go these two. The layer normalization and the multi uh, sorry self attention, then residual connection residual connection is your previous input plus your new input your new output, then you plus then you have the new output, so the residual connection is like this you you do the addition with your model your layer input and the, your layer output so you have the real layer output, okay and. Uh, this is the multi-layer perception layers. You have two layers basically. Then do the same thing: residual connection layer normalization. End up you have the representation for this uh, for this patch uh, for this block. Then you have a lot of uh, transformer blocks, or we can call it layer. Yeah, whatever. So this is the concept, and definitely if if you really want to go deep, I think you should go deep. Check out the Transformer paper or Transformer videos. The foundation is very important. Okay, so another way is uh, hybrid architecture because previously we we used the patch embedding to learn the representation of uh, patch. And Actually, there's maybe there's a better way to represent a patch, uh, which is to use the residual uh, ResNet. Uh, ResNet, um, they basically train the ResNet and use the early layers representation of the ResNet. Because when you train a ResNet, you will have the feature maps in each of the layers. And they use, they just treat this. Uh, they input a raw image to a ResNet and uh, calculate 2D feature maps. And, and you have a lot of 2D feature maps in a lot of layers, in each layers. And they only get the 2D feature maps from the early layers. Then treat that as a, a 2D image. But it's actually a 2D fe uh, feature maps. They flatten this into a sequence. So you have uh, uh, pages. So in these pages, you already have, it's not a raw uh, image matrix, it's already the feature map. So you can just use this vector to represent a patch. And how they do that, the patch size, because the feature maps in the ResNet is already one pixel 
in uh, this feature map, it already contains a lot of uh, pixels from the original image. So you don't need to have the big patch size to include enough information. information. So that's why they said said the patch size equals to one pixel in the feature map, in the ResNet feature map, because they already contain a lot of pixels effectively. So they fit this into the transformer, uh, vision transformer. So this is how, how they call hybrid model. Okay, then we want to look at into the pre-training and the fine-tuning. That's a little bit tricky part. When you do the pre-training, it's not like uh, Burr. Burr use the self-supervision self to do the pre-training. But usually in a computer vision, uh, in a compu computer vision, they use uh, uh, supervised learning to do the pre-training, which means uh, usually train on uh, image net, which contains a lot of images and uh, a lot of different classes. So you do the classification as a uh, pre-training and pre-training a large data set like this on uh, image net. Then when you want to fine tune your model, you definitely uh, need to remove your prediction layers. Uh, they train on your image net because image net usually maybe have 1000 classes, but in your downstream task, you have 10 class classes only. So you need to remove that prediction layer and uh, attach just uh, attach a prediction layer that you need for your downstream task. This is very straightforward. So uh, it's pre-training the fine tuning. And the tricky thing is usually doing the fine tuning is definitely good if you can fine tune this on a higher resolution network. And for the transformer architecture, theoretically, you can have uh, uh, whatever sequence length you want um, just up to your memory constraints. But the problem is when you do the pre-training, you, we already previously mentioned the positional embedding, right? Positional embedding basically means uh, you give the every position a uh, unique ID. Let's say we always uh, train on the image they have, they uh, probably is not Resolution is relatively low, so it means the patch size of the pre-training pre will be very low. Maybe we on, only have 100 pages. So the model only learn that, uh, only know that patch position can be 100. If you suddenly put into a patch position, maybe 2000 to the model, the model will now know how to deal with that. So the positional embedding will become many, meaningless. That's a problem when you're doing, uh, doing the fine tuning on the higher resolution. And how much impact it will have? Probably have certain impact, but not that huge. Because previously, you have seen that uh, the positional embedding, if you don't put any position information, the model still can perform reasonably, I would say. So that's still OK. Maybe the, the benefits of uh, change fine tuning on the higher resolution just outfit the outweigh the uh, positional embedding. Okay, so when you keep the page size the same, um, when you, then when doing the fine tuning, you have a larger sequence length because your image just have more pixels. More pixels with the same page size means more pages, means more sequence lens, and more sequence lens means you need more position in more positions to encode. And doing the pre-training, you just don't have, didn't train your model with that many positions. The model will not figure out uh, how to deal with those uh, larger, those higher position numbers. So uh, you just uh, lose the meaning of the pre-training. But still, doing the fine-tuning model can pick up that just to pick up very slowly because you don't have that many data points. You will see how they run a different size of sizes of model on different size of data sets. Okay, so the, here are the model variants. Basically, uh, vision blur base model with 12 layer, vision blur large model with 24 layers, and vision blur huge model with 22 layers. This base model is very similar to Burr base model, and this is very similar to Burr large model in terms of uh, number of layers, number of parameters. Basically, very, very close to that. 
And the comparison to the state of the art results are here. Um, in ImageNet, the state of the art results are, are is achieved by noisy student. Uh, basically, it's an efficient net uh, L2. And uh, its performance, performance is 88% accuracy. And just unfortunately, the even the best performing vision blur model cannot cannot defeat uh, a noisy student, but it's very close to to it. And imagine a real L is another data set. Uh, the vision blur huge uh, achieves the state of the R result. And for the CIF AR ten, it achieves the state of the R results as well. And by the way, apart from the ImageNet, the all state of the art results are achieved by uh, BITL, which is a ResNet architecture based model. And so, even like for the CFAR, CFAR 10 and CFAR 100, the uh, Vision Burr large model already achieved the state of the art results. And if you scale scale up the model size to huge, it's further further advanced the state of the art result. So it's very impressive. And um, here is also the how they achieve the state of the art results. And generally the Vision Burr huge model perform performs better than the Vision Blur large model, which is totally expected. And the tricky part, the most important part comes here, the number of uh, the compute resources you need to use to train your model. Basically, they pre-train uh, compared to the, the different architecture of models. They pre-train on the same, same data set. I think they average the kind of things here, or they add all of them. So here is the number of TPU, uh, number of days that you need to train on the D TPU. Uh, the lower the better, because it means your model is more efficient in learning. And here is the state of the art results. There's a uh, most powerful model, which is Vision Transformer. Only need to train on TPU for 2,500 days. And on the contrary, those uh, ResNet and uh, Efficient Nets, they need around 10,000 10, days, which is crazy, which is crazy. And even like 2,000 days on TPU is already crazy because you know TPU is very powerful. TPU V3 is very, very powerful. So that's uh, why I say this is a very expensive experiment. It's really, really unforeseeable for a small institutes or like a university to run this kind of uh, experiment it's just uh, too expensive but improvement impro improvement is already uh, here if you train just train a vision large uh, vision per vision transformer large you only need to have train on the tpu v3 for 700 days uh, which is significantly lower than the previous state of the art, which is like 10 times lower. Yeah, 10 times to 15 times lower. And I believe in the future, if they do some modification of the transformer, probably we can keep it to maybe 100 days. So let's see how it will involve, how it will involve in the next year, 2021. And here they also train the different model size, different size of model on different size of data sets. And you can see, ImageNet is a smaller data set, and this ImageNet 21K is a medium sized data set, and JFT is a huge, this gigantic, gigantic data set. And if you train on a smaller data set, the, the B, ResNet, uh, BIT, H basically perform better than Vision Transformers in every case. But when you scale up the data set, the Vision Transformers started to outperform the uh, ResNet model, which you basically outperform a lot. And the Vision Transformer 
huge achieve the best results on JFT 300 million. And by the way, because they tra they train those huge mo model like uh, vision transformer large, huge on a smaller data set like ImageNet, so they uh, employed employed uh, very strong regularization skills like uh, uh, learning rate decay and dropout and another one I forgot, but they basically involve three uh, regularization skills, but still model still uh, cannot perform too well. But just uh, how to solve the problem? Scale up your data. You just train the model, pre-train the model on larger data, then problem solved. And this is the phenomenon that we often see in deep learning, right? Okay, so uh, this is the another experiment. They basically tr train uh, those models on different po portion, different size of uh, uh, JFT. They train on 10 mediums images, 30 mediums, 100 mediums, and uh, 300 mediums. And you can see the ResNet architecture perform better than the vision blur when you train on a smaller size data set. But when you scale up the data set to 300 mediums, it just uh, underperform the uh, vision blur large. And what makes this uh, difference? Their assumption, and I think it's very true, is that uh, because ResNet consists of, uh, basically it's made of uh, convolutional neural network, and uh, see, convolutional neural networks basically have, just have a lot of assumptions about image. So this kind of inductive bias will just help your model perform better when you have the smaller size of a data set, because you put more prior knowledge to the model. But transformer doesn't have that at all. And it may maybe not perform well when you train on a smaller data set because you need to learn those kind of uh, uh, prior knowledge by themselves. But when you scale up, you actually learn those uh, uh, prior knowledge about the world, about images, and you, you even learn better, right? It's like AlphaGo uh, has a lot of uh, uh, maybe heuristic rules about about Go, but there's a, I think it's AlphaGo Zero or AlphaGo something version. There is a AlphaGo something. Uh, it's not AlphaGo, it's Alpha Zero or something. They, which it doesn't have any assumption about Go, but it still can perform uh, much better than AlphaGo. So that's the kind of um, a trend in the deep learning you will see from time to time and more and more often. Inductive inductive bias may, maybe doesn't help that. And the, the AlphaGo we we train AlphaGo on human. Yeah, we basically train AlphaGo on human, uh, like as per combat data. But AlphaGo Zero just uh, doesn't train on the human data at all. It just uh, play with itself to do a self play, and eventually learn a lot of uh, knowledge they were human never discovered before, and. Which I believe this vision transformer also learned something about images. They, we didn't really understand that. So that's I think that's why it's so interesting about deep learning. Okay, so let's look at the scaling study. Basically, it's like uh, all right. So let's look at the scaling study. Uh, it's a way they train different sizes of models on the same exactly the same data set and to see what's really uh, blocked the model, what's, what, what's the really bottleneck is. Okay, so uh, there are three different model architectures. One is transformer, another is ResNet, another is hybrid. And they train a different size of them, and they did just, it's not in this uh, picture, but they are different like base transformer, base uh, large, huge, and with different page sizes and ResNet as well, hybrid as well, then you can find that definitely when you, the X axis is uh, compute power. And when you increase the compute power, basically increase the model size, then you can see the model performance accuracy, the trans transfer accuracy on JFT data is just increasing uh, very strictly. 
But one thing that we need to pay attention to in this picture is that so when you train on train a transformer with the lower compute power, you can always achieve the same accuracy as the model they train with the larger compute power. They use uh, ResNet architecture, so it just tells us like the transformer is more efficient than the ResNet, and also here the transformer with ResNet like they have a very similar accuracy, but transformer use uh, much smaller compute power. And here on the ImageNet also, uh, you can see that uh, this e evaluating on ImageNet and um, the same performance, the same accuracy, but with less compute power. And one thing not working is uh, when you training on the less compute power, the hybrid, the hybrid model actually outperform first. But when you increase the model model size, which is means using more uh, compute power to pre-train, then the the trans the transformer started to catch up with the hybrid model uh, because like previously we mentioned uh, hybrid model can have an advantage on the, on a small data on a small smaller model size is because that uh, smaller model size or the same model size they train on the smaller data set it's because uh, it has some assumption about images but this can be overcome when you scale up the model or scale up the data set and they also look into uh, Transformers attention hats. How the transformer pays attention when processing an image, and they found out uh, when some attention has they attend to small regions of, a, of an image, and some attention has they like, pays like global attention to the, the image. And also, when you go to the deeper layers of the models, you find out the attention. Uh, distance between each heads like just got larger, which means the attention heads are less redundant and more space specialized in doing certain tasks. Maybe this attention heads always pays attention to um, like animal, and another attention heads pays attention to maybe machines. That kind of thing. This is just an example, of my imaginary. And uh, if you go to the deeper layers, the attention has. Uh, tends to pay more global attention to the whole picture, which makes sense because the deeper layers uh, for our intuition, for our experience, the, uh, the model will, will like to look at the more globally of the input. And this is the attention distance between attention heads. Uh, it's like if you go to the deeper layers here, uh, the more uh, layers you, you look at, the deeper layers that you look at, the, the larger attention uh, distance between attention heads uh, it is. So it makes sense, interesting finding as well. And they also use the attention, they try to visualize the attention uh, patterns, how the bird pays attention. They use the method called attention rollout, which is also uh, the paper they published this year, 2020. And I also have a video explain attention rollout paper. It's a very interesting paper and uh, uh, super important uh, in terms of uh, understanding attention in the transformer architecture. So I would highly recommend you to check out that paper. Super interesting, all the videos I made. And I'll just briefly walk through you how they do that. It basically average the attention weights of the a transformer, vision transformer across all heads. And all heads means like a uh, heads across layers and uh, the heads in the same layer. So basically the every head, every attention head in the transformer. And that's things called attention pattern or attention matrix. When you input the Im an image to the transformer, transformer will generate the attention attention weights or attention value, attention matrix for image, for the patches, depending on uh, how you call it. And when you process the patch number one, and the transformer will, the self-attention layer will calculate how much attention you need, it needs to pay to patch number one, patch number two, patch number three, patch number four, the rest of patches. And every head will have one attention pattern like this. 
then they kind of sum it up, average it up, then you can eventually get this picture. Okay, so as for the how they average those things across layer, they use they recursively multiply the weights weight matrix attention this is called weight, weight matrix or attention matrix of all layers. Yeah. So I skip I'm skipping a lot of things and definitely check it out the paper. And uh, this is how you end up getting, which means the transformer, vision transformer tends to pay attention to the object in the image. This makes sense because usually when you do the pre-training, you input this image, then the label of this image is dark. So the transformer, if transformer pays attention to this dark like this way, you will have uh, more chances to predict it correct. If it pays attention to the grass here, then you will not be able to tell this is dark, right? And this is airplane as well. It pays more attention to airplane itself instead of the rest of the region. And this is a little bit weird example, so let's just skip it. And quite intuitive, if we ask a human, a human to do classification, like image classification like this, I believe you will also look into the dark in this image, airplane in this image. Okay, and another starting point of transformer architecture is self supervised learning. Uh, like Burr, uh, Burr used a mask language modeling to do the self supervised learning. Basically, it's mask the 15% of the tokens to let the model reconstruct those 15% mask token. And in this paper, they also try to use this approach. Uh, they call the masked patched prediction. Uh, quite interesting. They basically corrupt, or you can call mask 50% of the patch embeddings and then the model to reconstruct those patch embeddings. But you may ask, the embedding is kind of a dis is kind of a continuous value. How do you reconstruct that? So there are a few ways in the uh, uh, ASR domain. There's, they also use BERT to, to do this, this kind of uh, self-supervised learning. They, they quantize those um, embeddings. It's kind of maybe you call the uh, audio snippet embedding or something, I forgot the name. And they quantize that so, so that you can predict that. You can use your soft uh, prediction layer, softmax layers to, to predict that. In this case, they don't use that. They just uh, try to predict the color, the mean color of the patch. Basically, it's the, there are 512 different colors and your patch will be one of them. It's a mean color. And if you predict correctly, then you you reduce the loss function. You predict incorrectly, you increase the loss function. So by doing the bare propagation, you can train, you can pre-train your model. And that's interesting. So that uh, they do the self-supervised learning on the image net, and they found out if they do that, it's two percent better than just training from scratch on image net. But still four percent behind the uh, supervised uh, pre-training. So still have some way to go. But I believe in the future, maybe this kind of a uh, mean color uh, prediction is not a most optimal way. Uh, I will. I'm quite sure this is not the most optimal way. There definitely will be some other way, like quantization of the embeddings. They for you to do the reconstruction or constructive learning to predict if this embedding is uh, from the original image or it's the random image. So the constructive learning seems like a good candidate to for the future work, and I believe they are doing already. So. Uh, Let's just wait for a few months. We will probably see another tra vision transformer and uh, brings us uh, more breakthrough and with just a self-supervised learning. I am quite confident this will happen in the next year. Okay, so a summary of this uh, paper is uh, they use a st standard transformer encoder without using any inductive bias, bias and achieve a lot of state-of-the-art. And they... How they do that, they use image, they, they feed the image as a sequence of pages. Then we can use the NLP technique. We just treat this uh, uh, a sequence of pages as, as a sequence of words. 
then we can do everything we already have. We can apply everything we already have in NLP domain to computer vision. This is kind of the reverse import. Usually it's like NLP use the techniques they existing in the computer vision to improve NLP uh, models. And now it's like a bar computer vision borrowing something that already in the NLP for a few years to improve their results. So good to see this kind of uh, cross-domain improvement, uh, cross-domain interaction happening. And more importantly, it's cheaper to pre-train because there are already have a lot of different ways to pre-train on ImageNet, uh, self-supervised learning, self-supervision self pre-training. But uh, it's not that efficient. And this transformer, vision transformer just makes it more uh, efficient. So yeah, that's all for today's video. If you have any thoughts in the comment or what you want to see in the future, leave in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe for more relevant deep learning videos like this. And other than that, take care. Until next time.